All right, everybody, great to have you with us again for another podcast, Friedman Adventures. And today, we are blessed to have an old dear friend of mine, a guy that has a huge amount of historical knowledge about sword fishing, and that is Tom Durr. Tom, it's good to see you, my friend. How are you? I'm great. Good to see you. I, we, might, I might have some knowledge because I lived through it. <laughs> You've got a lot of knowledge, and I can't wait to get into it with you, and we're going to do that right away. But I just want to say, first of all, thank you for your kindness. You've had us out a few times on the Judith Ann. We've had great vision. We've gone to Santa Barbara. We fished local bass. We fished local rockfish. You've uh, Now I have a relationship with my two sons, Patrick and Philip, and that means a lot to me. And just want to say thanks, man. It's been a lot of fun. Well, it, makes, it means a lot to me, too, because I'm always looking for a buddy to go fishing. You got one anytime. I mean, I just, Steve too. He'll go anytime you want. Also, oh, there you go. I get up in the mornings, and if I got any inkling to go fishing, it's spontaneous. Right. Oh, it's flat calm out there. Ah, I got the right kind of bait. Let's go. Who's going? Who wants to go? Anybody around? I'll take a stranger. Right here. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been a hundred percent on that. Let's go back in time a little bit. First of all. When did your interest in fishing begin, and how did it begin? Who influenced you and shoved you toward fishing? Well, my stepfather. Uh, my mother married him when I was 10. The only fish I'd ever caught up to that time was a little guppy in a creek somewhere. You know, chase him around with a paper cup. <laughs> or a toad frog, or what do you call them, tadpoles? Yeah. Yeah. And that was pretty exciting. And then he took me to the lakes where you buy to go buy pay a ticket to go in started with a cane pole and a bobber catching bluegills wow and then it just turned into an entire instantly, career instantly. instantly all i could think about was going fishing wow i know i know the feeling same thing with me it started with a freaking drop line on the redondo monstad pier for me i still have dreams where i see a bobber bouncing around in the water and i haven't fished with a bobber since i was 10 or 11 that's amazing that's yeah. amazing all right so then Let's go to your first job in sport fishing. When was it? Where was it? Well, it was 61 when I started trying to get a deckhand job. And I got a part-time a few days in 61, and winter rolled around, and there was no jobs. Every landing had maybe one boat fishing rock cod. And whatever the... Whatever the number one deckhand was, got that job generally. It was actually the most sought after job there was because the side money and everything was better fishing for rockfish. Yeah. So it took me to the second year to get a full time job, 62. What boat was that? Yeah, it was on a, <laughs> it was on an old boat called the Best Two. The Best Two. It was an yeah, old macro fishing, old macro fishing boat. You wouldn't. It actually had a sister there called the. Uh, oh man, what was it called? I can't even think of it now. But yeah, it was a real beauty. No compass. <laughs> the compass was downstairs and the boat had a flying bridge. And you look through a plate glass, little square plate glass. You look down through the glass to the compass down below. Oh my God. Yeah. And you had to take both hands <laughs> to turn the wheel. No bilge pump on that boat. Oh shit. So you had a hand pump or what? A bucket. Oh God. I had the bucket to bilge out. So you couldn't see the you'd you'd have to leave the landing or you'd have to leave the harbor, and go down below to see the compass, and then set your course. If there was nobody else in front of you, you could follow, and then go up and put some stars together. Because oh, you, so you were doing celestial navigation. In no, those days? you just had to get your compass bearing, and then you had to go up and look at a, oh. some stars and. And then you had, okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, because you couldn't see the compass from up above through that place because it was all bleached Jesus out. Jesus Christ, that's crazy. So hey, let me let me just, people nowadays, they walk in the wheelhouse of their little boat and they push a button huh. and you didn't have GPS, you didn't have any of that stuff and you were using bearings to get on spots, it was a little more difficult in those days, wasn't it? Well, even more than dip, even though bearings, uh, I, I never had a, a, for the first five years, I never had a boat with, with a radar. Oh my God. And, and, and my I, father meter was an old stylus paper meter yeah. that half the time I wasn't provided a new roll. I'd get an old roll and I'd have to turn it over backwards. I remember that, man. I'd have to tweak the stylus. Yep. 
and it never went it didn't go below 30 fathoms so every time i fished rock cod i had nothing jesus nothing no radar no gps no nothing we would fish up and down the coast on spots as big as the boat in 100 fathoms of water by time and distance wow and when you hit your time and distance and your course steering by hand of course no autopilot then you had to meter around in the fog until you found it jesus talk about difficult huh it wasn't easy yeah exactly and then you go tuna fishing or offshore fishing you're running out on a compass course keep track of your time and your course and then you start trolling and you're going up and down and in and out for six to eight hours and you start home and you go hmm eeny meeny miny mo boom i'll go this way wow and then you burn your eyeballs off all the way to home to find the breakwater wow incredible man they, yeah people don't know how good they have it now do they well the finer boats had beacons they in radio beacons they could get on like san diego had a radio beacon newport beach did not yeah we take an old AM radio, portable radio, and we figured out what's which which uh, radio stations, like maybe in Anaheim. Yeah, that from a certain course you could tone it, and when you lost the tone, you were on course. Oh, okay. So we had other ways, but you'd look for the island, try to get a bearing off an island, which way to go, and then you'd look to see the lights on the coast. Jeez, how was fishing? Let's. Pick Catalina Island. How was Catalina Island in the 1960s? A lot of fun. Really? A lot of fun. Tell me about it. Well, in the springtime, there would be a line of overnight boats. I could sit here and name them if you want. But there'd be a line of overnight boats from Newport Beach. There was no Dana Point at the time. So from Newport Beach to Redondo. Maybe 8 to 12 overnight boats every single night and they'd be lined up on the front side of the island we didn't back in those days we rarely fished the back side really no we uh-huh. didn't have to yeah i mean believe it or not let's say we were at the canyon what we call the canyon it's between henrock and gallagher's yeah every boat would be between not henrock i'm sorry frog rock and gallagher's yeah and there'd be a line of boats all in the same depth that whole distance you put your light out when you anchor up at 4 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, and the fish come underneath the light, and they start biting. By 8 or 9 o'clock, if it's a good day, you're done. With what? Gar? You catch a Anywhere from 100 to 300 log barracuda. Jeez. I mean, you're talking like 7 to 10 pound fish, like that? Big? And up. Jeez. Up. Like friggin' wahoo. Well, big enough that the rods we had, unless you had a big Calcutta and you were one of the... St- you were one of the good guys that could really fish with a, a feather, with a purple lead head feather. Yeah. yeah, hex head feather. Yeah, um, they could bounce them with those. But the normal piece, normal people with the fiberglass rods, you couldn't bounce those barracuda. No way, you break. So, how many people do you have on the boat normally? Thirty people or something like that. Forty nine, or the bigger boats had. And how many crew members do you have? Yeah, but the bigger boats had eighty people. Yeah. And, and how many crew members? Well, on my boat, there was just two of us. Well, I mean, how are you gaffing all these fish? You're just going full rack. That's what's boom, fun. Boom, 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 boom. That's what's fun. Yeah, I know. It's bitching, right? Yeah, it's just like an animal course stack. You throw one on the deck, you wrap it around your arm and kick it with your foot and run to the next guy. I Bag know. Bag it yourself. You can't do, you know. Freaking amazing. That's part of the fun. Wow. So you've got barracuda, anything else to go with it? Are you catching oh, yeah. yellowtail? Are you yeah, catching sea bass? You got 50 to 100 yellowtail and calico bass and bonita up to wazoo every day. Just like clockwork. It was beautiful just to, just to watch what was going on from boat to boat through the fleet. That's freaking amazing. It was that way every day. And how about when you moved into the summertime? Same thing? Same thing. Yeah. Now, they might branch out to go to Clemente or Albacore. And then they would go to the backside when the squid showed up if you left early enough but my uh my boat never left before two o'clock in the morning so we were getting there just at the crack of dawn every day wow what were you earning as a deckhand in 1960 and as a captain you remember how much what was your pay hell yes i remember (laughs) (laughs) the highest i got paid for being a deckhand was 15 dollars a day wow cashing in huh no by check (laughs) 
No, I mean, not much money, obviously. No. I remember I was making, when I started on the Redondo Special, 12 bucks, and it was a big deal when I got to 18 Yep. Yeah. I never made it to 18 In fact, my when I got my license for my first season, I was $25 for a captain. And what kind of tips did you make in those days? Like fish cleaning, did you, like, I mean, a lot of guys make a lot of money nowadays cleaning fish. Did you make a lot of money then, or was it just something you had to do, or what? And that brings up the you pickle had to, jar. You had by to the way. ask that, didn't you? I, I want the pickle jar story. I've, I've heard it many times. Well, there's still, I think, a few guys around that can identify with the pickle jar. The fishing game regulations in the '60s was no filleting on board, so you could only head and gut or scale. And in Newport. And in San Diego, when I went to San Diego at first, uh, late 60s, middle 60s, late 60s, we didn't charge for fish cleaning. The old pickle jar came out, you filled it half full of water, and you set it up on the board, and you would try to negotiate one of your regulars or somebody that knew you uh, to come up with their bag first. And then slip a dollar bill in there. I'm putting a dollar in the pickle jar, you tight wads, right? Kind of thing. A little uh, more subliminal message. They wouldn't that. say that, but they would make a little show of it yeah. sometimes. But even you're if you're trying it, to induce the rest of the pack. Well, even if, even if it wasn't vocal, a deck hand, or I would reach up and I'd go make it stick on the side of the jar where they could see it. Yeah. Oh, right. A little subtle advertising. Yeah, yeah. And what did that result in? Did you make a lot of tips? It depends on the people, and it depends on how good a job they thought I did. But I learned right away. I had kids. Boom, boom, boom. I had four kids when I was still a deckhand. So I didn't support them making 12 bucks a day. Right. I supported them with the side money. Yes. Now, I don't know. I, I love fishing so much, I'd never, I never took a day off, ever. If the boat ran, I was on it. Never took a day off. What's your longest stretch you ever did? No day off. Well, I, you over did a, like eighty over days. Over hundred year after Jeez. year after year. Jeez. Way over a hundred. Wow. Two hundred maybe. Two fifty maybe. And did you ever? I hit, never kept track of it. You were freaking enjoying it the whole time. I loved every minute of it. That's awesome. Man, that's heaven. When you find something you love that much, that well, is fantastic, Tom. There's nothing better. That's all I wanted to do, and that's how I supported my family. And all I, my dream was to be a captain, and I just couldn't wait. My hands were on the wheel every time I had a chance. By the time they fished a spot twice, I knew when I, knew when I was going to push the anchor over before the captain did. Because I was watching the bearings as he pulled up. So you were a student. I mean, you had in your head, you had four kids. You knew you had to feed them. You knew you couldn't do it on 15 bucks a day. You wanted to move up and be a captain. But you didn't only want to be a captain for the money. You wanted to be a really good captain. So it sounds to me like you became a student about everything that was going on around you. You had to be observing and soaking it in, right? It was just natural. Just natural. I didn't even think about it. It's just what I wanted to do i wanted to catch those fish and i wanted to find them i've always been interested in in finding them fishing where nobody else does find the little acorn here and there you know and you save those what you do with those spots you save them for the tough days yeah and you don't clean them off you take what you need and you save it so the hunt is something that drives you you like to hunt don't you yeah i was called a cruise boat or the hunter yeah really yeah, that's amazing. I hey, can't I can't sit in the fleet and wait for fish. Can't do it. I know. Well, I remember that when I was in San Diego, there were guys that would fish with the fleet, and there were other guys that said, fuck this, man. I'm going to go blaze my own trail and find my own fish. And I like those guys, you know? Well, that's the way it is everywhere. I mean, it doesn't matter where you fish. That's the way it is everywhere. It just depends on, uh, let's say you're fishing uh, Morro Bay or someplace like that. you got two or three boats in your fleet. You go to San Diego in the heyday of the '60s, Jeez. and you had a hundred boats in your. Remember fleet. the lights at night, man? When you're going, well, of course you I do. See, I know, and, <laughs> but for people that never saw that, that was amazing, wasn't it? There's freaking just the horizon was full of lights. 
Sport boats running to the albacore zone. Yeah, and some were running in the island, some were running on the beach, and some were running into each other. Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit too. Let's let's jump right. Let's jump right into that right now. The fishing fool. That was. We just recently had this disaster on the Conception. Horrible situation. Thirty-three passengers, one crew member died. The seventy-five foot Conception caught on fire. First, let me just ask you this. So, the captain of the boat is up on manslaughter charges. Now, we may not have all the evidence and all the facts, but what we do know, is that appropriate? Do you think that's? Well, the buck stops at the top. So they gotta go, they gotta go to the top and work their way down, at least that. Is there anything that can confused... he's responsible for everything that goes on that boat. So somebody should have been awake, number one. Well, you gotta remember, he's, he's not just the captain, he's the master of the ship. And there's, you know, the old rule is, the buck stops. And the last one off is the captain. Well, let me just hypothetically say, he says to a crew member, I'm going to sleep. I, I'm burned out. I need you to stay awake. Going to sleep. And he goes to sleep. And then the crew member goes to sleep. W- what about that? Well, there's rules and regulations that we all have to abide by. And if <clears throat> I don't care if he's a rookie captain. The rules and regulations for overnight boats is you have to have two captains so there's no reason why one of them wasn't up you don't anchor a boat and leave people in harm's way it's just unforgivable i can't even imagine doing it yeah did that does that fire did can a fire like take place like that without an accelerant nearby do you, do you have any spec? Do you want to speculate on what you no, think happened? No, because I know it's my biggest fear all my career is having a fire on the boat. Yeah, and I've never had one, and I thank God for it. But my understanding is, listening to the interviews and everything, uh, that it was the smoke that killed everybody. Uh huh. Not the fire. Yeah. But a fire on a boat is the scariest thing there is. Oh my I, God. I'd rather take a boat, take it on the water, than I would fire. Yeah. So, okay, let's go to the Fish and Fool, because a lot of our people probably never heard about this. The Fish and Fool ran out of San Diego. I can remember Carol Stock, she's now with the Intrepid, and I can remember her in tears with me on the phone. So tell us, what happened with the Fish and Fool? When was that, first of all, more or less? Uh, 80s. Yeah, and, and what happened? They went down to Ben's Rock, right? Yes. Which is near San Martin Island. Yes. It's about four and a half miles below it. Uh-huh. So roughly 145 miles from San Diego, from Point Loma, something eh, like that? Yeah, something like yeah. 150 maybe. But yeah. I had fished it many times with a fishing pool. I owned it for five years. Oh, there we go. Beautiful. And one of my buddies, a retired policeman uh, for Newport Beach, uh, later became, uh, what do you call it, private investigator. It just so happens that the family members of the people that died, hired him to investigate the case. Wow. And then, of course, he called me many, many, many times to pick my brains about the boat and where they fished and how they fished and everything that happened. So right. I, I know all the details about that. Let's hear it. There was a rogue wave, right? Is that what happened? That no, it was over? not a rogue wave. Ben's Rock is a high spot that comes up out of deep water. Yeah. And outside of Ben's Rock is an area we call Six Fathom. And you are you have a shelf there that just drops right off to, to the depths. So anytime you have a big swell, it's coming in, and it hits that six fathom, and then it hits Ben's Rock. And you could be sitting there on the boat, and you'll go up on a swell 20, 30 feet when it's like that, and then Jesus. just go down like a rock. Wow. So even if it was flat calm, when I anchored up, when I fished that rock, I never left the wheelhouse. I'd actually sit on the sun deck with the motors running. Wow. Now, maybe I'm a little scaredy cat. I don't know, but that's the way I did it. Yeah. Because those swells had come out of nowhere. And I knew Gary very well. And Gary was the captain? Yeah. Yeah. Four of my friends. Last name of Gary? Don't worry. Not important. It'll come come to you in the next. Names is the hardest thing for me to remember now. All right. Anyway. Uh, I'll think of it probably before we're done. But yeah. anyway, he uh, he made a mistake, an honest mistake. He uh, what, what The way it turned out was that morning there was a swell running, 
And when they left the anchorage at San San Martin, they were they were watching the view of the breakers at Ben's Rock because it's awesome. You know, the breakers are just combing over the rock. And for some reason, he was drift fishing it, something I would never do, but he did and probably worked out most of the time. But he he made a drift, and uh, I don't know what he was catching, but he came up to make a nest, another drift, and he came, here's the rock, and the swell's going this way with the current, and he came up like this to the down swell side of the rock yeah. and turned the boat sideways oh. right when a swell came. Oh, no. And he, of course, never got out of the wheelhouse. People that were on deck got thrown over the side. And uh, this was a five, I think five people ended up in the water, five or six. Uh, the cook wound up on one side of the boat by herself, and she wound up with the life rafts, all three of them, to herself. And the other people all ended up in a group. And they, this is a eyewitness report from the one guy that survived. Only one survivor. Yeah, one survivor. Yeah. He, uh, they got together in a group and decided, treading water, that the island looks closer than the beach. And it was. It was four, four and a half miles, and the beach was like seven. What they didn't know was the current runs strong. And they could have, as far as they went up current, they could have easily made the beach. Yeah. But they went bye-bye one at a time Yeah. as they were going. They had nothing to hold on to. Yeah. And, and you the, get tired, and you're scared. And the last guy was the he was the most overweight. He was the oldest, and he managed to survive. He was about a hundred yards offshore, and he had just enough strength to yell loud enough that the, the Mexican lobster fishermen heard him and came wow. out and got him. Thank God he wouldn't have made it the last hundred yards. Oh my God, thank God, huh? And uh, yeah, that's how he survived. Wow. And that was else, a, that was a huge tragedy. Thir- Thirteen people, I think. Uh, yeah. Probably, is that the, the greatest loss of life in sport fishing previous to this conception thing? Which As far is, as I know of, yeah. Yeah, right? I, yeah, I've never well, heard sport of fishing like industry has been really, really luck, lucky with loss of lights. I mean, yeah. we've mounted them up on the rocks and mounted them up on the beach. I mean, I've seen a boat on the beach right in front of the Coronado Hotel for a weekend in July. Jeez. Yeah, front page of the San Diego Union. And you know, nobody ever gets hurt. But uh, this time they did. And the second time, what you're talking about, they did. So, But on and on, it's been a really clean industry. Yeah, it has been. Let's go back to the fishing thing now. Yeah, so we better, talked about better subject. Yeah, right. No, but this is interesting history of fishing and sport fishing. Now, you know, our audience knows something about probably the greatest tragedy in sport fishing history. And it's interesting for me to relive it and, and hear it again. San Diego, back in the 60s, you worked with... So many guys, Lopreste and all these great guys, but how was the fishing in San Diego in those days? And you were a Newport guy that went to San Diego, right? So you were kind of, you know, one of those uh, northern guys, right? Quotations that were going to try to make it in San Diego. How was the fishing then? Phenomenal. But you talk about Frank Lopresti, we were deckhands together in the 60s in Newport, me and him. Frank was a school teacher. Right? Well, when he first got out of college, yeah. 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 But we worked together on the, uh, on the, uh, here I go again. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I forget the name of the boat, and I can see it in my face. But we worked together with Spike Taft, who was another legend in our industry. Yeah, right. And I learned one heck of a lot from Spike and from working with Frank. Frank had a work ethic that was unbelievable. He wanted to. He wanted to be a businessman, and he worked hard at it. And, and he friggin' succeeded. You can definitely say that. Absolutely. But yeah. we both we both came from Newport. I was about six months ahead of him when he when he showed up down there. At the same time, Eddie McEwen went down there from Long Beach. Uh, Great guy. I loved Eddie. Jack, uh, one of my best buddies, uh, Jack Montgomery, took the Miss L down from Long Beach. And uh, we kind of changed things around down there a little bit. How did you do that? So let's talk about that. How did you change things? Well, back in the 50s and 60s, San Diego was mostly Yelltail capital of the world, you know, and it was all about Yelltail. Coronado Island. Yeah, and Alicor. Yeah. And when we went down there, 
especially me, I probably did it more than anybody. I was used to filling the bags with something, calico bass, halibut, sand bass, rockfish. And they weren't into that down there, so I kind of They were we kind of perpetuated. Yellowtail or albacore, nothing in between, right? Yeah, maybe right. some barracuda or sea yeah. bass in wintertime, but yeah. they didn't they didn't do those other things too much. And we kind of got that going and it it exploded and everybody did it. Because we were, that's what we were used to doing. So you were catching what? Sand bass, for example? Like in the springtime? Oh, sand bass fishing was phenomenal down there. <laughs> I want to hear about it, oh. man. We're off that bull ring and that, down that way? Or? Anyway, from, anywhere from Torrey Pines all the way down to, what do you call it, Hippolito? Yeah. You know, down Jeez. there to Sunshine and really? all that. Well, that's where they migrate. That's where they spawn. Yeah. And what was it like? I mean, how good was it? Tell me. Well, Don't keep this a secret. There's days when you could lift pull five pounders. Really? Yeah. You just put a bait and just. Yeah, you stop on breezers. I mean, they're up there breezing along the surface, moving around. It, what do you, you see? Know, like a color spot, or you see the actual yeah, breeze? Ripples. Yeah, Jeez. they're migrating. They're coming up the coast. Wow. Five pounders, full speed. Yeah. How many could you catch on it? So you got forty oh. people on the boat. How many fish could you get? Well, we could keep ten. So it was, it was nothing to have limits every single day. And would would you fish sand bass and then go? Try to catch yellows after that, or well, sometimes depends upon what run you were on. Obviously, well, the open party boats would would target the yellowtail because that's what brought the people down. Yeah, so they'd sit and they'd fish yellowtail all day long. I've seen boats anchor up at twelve midnight and seven o'clock the next night. They haven't moved; they're still waiting for the bite. It's hardcore. Yeah, because it's called position A or or. position proper, and you don't give it up if you got it. Yeah, I know. But me, no, I'd pull the anchor and take Because mine was charters. I didn't have to catch fish. I had to please my group. Yeah. Give and them a good I'd experience. Go over and, I'd go over and catch sand bass and halibut. And and then the next thing you know, we got live squid and we're fishing the bottom and we start catching yellowtail too. So now we're catching it all in one spot. Drifting. Wow. I remember times when the halibut were spawning, we're catching a lot of big halibut on the anchor. And I'd actually go out to commercial fish the halibut, and I couldn't keep the yellowtail off the hook. Really? Yeah. The yellows were getting in the way? Yeah, drifting in the mud, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. In fact, you told me that you have seen 500, this was up here though, 500 fish days on halibut. 500 halibut, is that mm-hmm. correct? Yeah. I've seen full limits for 50 people on the anchor. That's freaking amazing. And a limit, what, in those days was 10? Five. Oh, okay. So, yeah, 50 people, 250 on Yeah, it. 250, yeah. Jeez, that's... I'm it, sorry, 250. Freaking amazing, right? Well, they're small fish. Most of them there were... There was no size on them in those days? No. Yeah. So most of them were at that 18 to 22 inch deal. And it, it was nothing to have five fish over 20 in a day. We were catching some big fish. That, but they were... Things things come and go and things change. You can't, you can't count on... That's the thing about... What interested me from the very start, my first boat trip was a barge off of Newport Pier. And I used to watch the fishing flicks on Channel 13 back in the 50s. Yeah, a guy named McClintock, I think, did it. Well, Frank Hale was, Frank Hall was there. Then. Yeah. I mean, the sharpshooter and yeah, all those yeah. boats. I mean, I just remember it vividly because I couldn't wait every week to watch it. Yeah. And what caught my interest was deep sea fishing. It was just different. Yeah. It wasn't ocean fishing. It wasn't sport fishing. It was deep sea fishing. You mean the the term deep sea suggested to you some adventure or something, right? You like that. Sounds Well, because to this day, I'll tell people, well, what do you think we're going to catch? And I said, you could catch anything. You throw your line in the water, you don't know what you're going to catch. That mystery is so intriguing to people, isn't it? That's what comes together with deep sea fishing. Yeah. And it happens. You, every every once in a while, I mean, remember back when John Dipley was running the Queen of Sea? It was in the sixties, I guess. I Boy, don't, do I, I re- well, I remember it back in the seventies. Yeah, well, he's fishing sand bass in May out here on the on the horseshoe, and, and he catches an albacore. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh my God! That's the truth. Yeah. So that's that's the theory. You know, you throw your line in the water, you don't know what you're going to catch. Right. Right. It's amazing. Yeah. Weird things happen, and that's 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 what gets in your mind you know i've always tried to tell people it, you're not going fishing to catch you're going fishing it's a state of mind it's a thought in your head 
I mean, I, Tom, I love that. I mean, because you're selling a dream, a fantasy, uh, an adventure. And if you happen to have a down day, you don't catch a bunch of fish, you still had that dream. It didn't come to fruition this particular time, but you still got out on the water and experienced all the great stuff that is part of a fishing trip. And there's so much from the dolphin to the whales to everything that goes into a fishing trip. It's really amazing. I love that. You can't beat it. Right. And then you never have anybody disappointed. When you start selling yellowtail, 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 or die, you end up with some people that are disappointed. Yeah, well, that's okay. It's, uh, it's, all, in, it's all in how you want to market your, yeah. your particular boat. Uh, I don't have anything against it. It's just I'm just different. Right, right. I want I want to see people getting bites and swinging and missing and catching and losing. And Hell yes. Staying busy and staying active. You know, instead of just leaning elbows on the rail waiting. You know, everybody wants that. Yeah. Well, Tell, go ahead. Well, that's what happened when I went on the barge. Yeah. My first time when I was 12 years old. I'd never been on the ocean on a boat. So the ride out to the barge was kind of interesting. Yeah, right. And then when I got to the barge. It was kind of doing this slow thing, you know. Yeah. Deep swell, slow thing. And it got warm, and then there was no wind. You know, the perfect seasick conditions. Yeah. And I wasn't catching nothing. <laughs> Didn't know my head from a hot rock as far as fishing in the ocean. Yeah. And I was starting to get, hmm, I don't know if I feel too well. Yeah, right. Right. And I told my stepdad, I said, can I have something to eat? I was smart enough to know I wanted to eat. Yeah. And so while I was eating this burger, I was watching these two guys at the rail. And they were catching fish like crazy. Little rockfish, tomcod, mackerel. So I watched what they were doing. And I said, my stepdad, can I buy that? It was what they were fishing with was like a lucky lure. Yeah. With a shiny sinker and a treble hook on the bottom. Yeah. And a little piece of bait on it, and they were catching little rockfish, and they were catching fish, and they were busy. Yeah. And I said, "Can I want to, you know, can you buy that for me so I can do that?" He says, "Sure." And I started catching fish, and the rest is history. And that observation, right? Hooked. Yeah, you were hooked. Yeah. But that you never lost that because you do. You've told me that when you went, you're, were a deckhand, you were watching the captain. You were that observation, watching how somebody else is having success, what they're doing to accomplish this goal, became part of the way you attacked fishing, right? As a captain, as a deckhand, being observant was really I, important. I've, I've never been the guy to sit in the wheelhouse or, or hang out up top and watch everybody. If, if everybody's not busy, if they're not catching, if they're not catching, <clears throat> what I do, what I like to do, is go down and fish. As long as my patrons are being taken care of by the crew where I can Wet put a, a rod. Yeah. If somebody's, I'll walk up to the person that's not catching nothing and stand right next to him and, and start catching a fish or trying to. And then I'll explain to them what I'm doing, why the fish are biting, why they're not biting, why I think they're not biting, you know, and teach them on the spot. And it just happened just like one of my last trips. We had a complete novice group with rent rods, and rent rods are never the best to fish with. But they're not bad. And the Bonita started biting. And this guy, this young guy, about 25 or so, and very out, outspoken, very outward, nice gentleman. Uh, and he's going, I never catch anything when I come out here. I don't know why. I never catch anything when I come out here. So I went over and I showed him exactly how to fly line a bait and hook the bait, how to pick out the right bait, everything that I do. And they were, Benito were biting good, so all he had to do was get it 10 feet from the rail, and he was going to get one. Oh, my God, he started catching them one after another, after another, after another, and he would have, I was a hero. I can imagine, yeah, because you become... That's the kind of thing you do. You become a teacher, don't you? I mean, some of the most successful coaches that I love, Lou Holtz at Notre Dame, John Wooden at UCLA, they called themselves teachers, right. not coaches. They right. were teachers. Right. And, and it sounds like you have that same attitude. Well... That's the thing. Not everybody can can view or see it in their own eyes and put it together. You got to show them. Right, right. And it's amazing to me, but that's just the way it is. And a lot of people just want to don't want to bother to learn. 
thousands and thousands of times I walked up the side of the boat and the guy's fishing the bottom all day long and the fish are biting like crazy in the stern or up the sides. And a lot of those people, I'll say, you, you know, you want to learn how to do this? You want to get back here with everybody else and wrestle around for a spot? And they go, no, nah, I just want to do this. So it's all, it's all up to the person. And you are a huge proponent. If, if I were to say to you, give me a tip on how to get bit. I'm, I'm just guessing here. You're going to say, light line is a big key to your success. And of course, choosing a hot bait and all those ancillary things that go along with it. But you like to fish light line, don't you? Yeah, and you'll fish big yellows with light line. I like to fish. I don't like to catch. I'll catch them. But I don't like it. I like to fish. I see these young kids now, and I see this technology and the gear that they have. They're not angling. Now, what kills me is they'll come out with the light gear where they can, and they can angle, and they got the talent. But when the fish start biting, go to the heavy stuff and grind it in like a guppy. Lay the rod on the rail and crank it straight in. My son's like that. I hate it. Nah, he's like I'm like that way too, actually. So <laughs> sorry. They make fun of me. You know, I take them on a tuna trip and I hook a tuna and I fight it in for 45 minutes with my 12 pound, 30, 35 pound tuna, and I go, "That's fishing. That's angling. That's having a good time." I give the fish a chance to get away. Of course, for me, I don't eat them. So as soon as I get them up, I cut the line and let them go. <laughs> yeah, see, we eat them or give them to the neighbors or something. Hey, let me let me take you back to San Diego. Best albacore fishing you can ever remember. What's some of the best Albi fish and best trip that you can remember? Hundreds of them. Give me one. Um, okay. I was on a boat called the Nova. Frank and Frank Lepresti and I were had this boat together called the Nova in 1970. And I had a group that ended up being one of my best groups that I kept for years. Because normally I got the novice groups, but I had this group that could really fish. 20 old guys, senior guys that could that could go, and they they would charter five, six, seven times a year. And it was a it was a night I'll never forget because I was going out and we had a little wind chop and and the windows got water on them and it's hard to see at them. Now, luckily, I'm on a boat now that's got a nice radar. So I see a boat on a radar coming kind of crossing my bow from left to right or going to cross my bow from left to right. So I'm watching and watching and watching and watching and I go, man, where's the lights? I can't see the lights. Make a long story short, it was a boat coming in, a long range boat coming in, sound asleep at the wheel with no lights on. Jesus. And he would have hit me. So I got on the radio and started putting it out. And one of the other boats behind me chased him down, blew the horn and woke him up. So he, <laughs> he saved, he saved the guy, but yeah, that was the start of the trip and excuse me um just breaking day and my dad can at the time was a guy named ricky dozberg who just retired and sold a fury at dana point he just had a birthday or something on facebook i don't i said hi to him yeah, just probably. the other day yeah well ricky started working with me when he was 15. yeah and he went to san diego with me and so i was on the wheel and there was a, I was catching up with the boat. I'm going, we got 20 miles to go. Why am I, why am I catching up with somebody? I could tell by the target it was at least a sport boat. Yeah. So to make a long story short, now I'm watching through the binoculars, through the binoculars, through the binoculars, I go, oh, Danny, Danny boy, what are you doing? <laughs> it's still dark, and he stopped. It's just about to crack dawn. And I knew he had the sporters because it was a Tuesday, and they're killers. So... That's so funny. So I told Ricky, I said, go down and drop a couple lines behind the boat. Drop, drop a couple jigs out. Remember now, it's gray. It's not daylight yet. It's gray, yeah. though? It's not pitch yeah, it's, dark. No, it's gray. gray. Okay. He had the first one still in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> so off we go, man. Guess what? What? About 9, 10 o'clock, 9, 9, 10. I think it was about 9, 10. Boom, boom. I hear Danny fire up. Well, it was wide open, right? So I heard Danny fire up. And Danny was running what boat? It's Danny, uh, God. Here I go again. I, Samson. I Danny Samson, the okay. Charger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Charger. And I thought, oh, man, he killed him. So I hear him fire up. And before he even takes off, he calls Point Loma office. Point Loma office, we got 
charger will begin at uh, 2 o'clock with 330 albacore. Jeez, 2 o'clock ETA too, man. Yeah. That's freaking nice. Yeah, so this is Rod and Reel. You actually get this some is, sleep. This is Rod and Reel now, you know. Yeah, 330 on the Albi. Nice hit. Well, I have to say that year we averaged getting in be- between 6 and 7 on 80% of the time. Frickin' like, banker's hours for albacore phenomenal, fishing. Phenomenal yeah. season. How far now are you? So fishing? anyway, I go, Ricky, Ricky. What we were doing was we were bagging five fish per bag, stuffing them in, five fish per bag. Yeah. So I said, what do we, he says, I said, how are we? He says, oh, we're done. Every, the people are putting the rods away. We're done. <laughs> and What time is this? Like nine ten. Jesus. So I said, we got 10 fish in every bag. And he says, oh, yeah. I said, so we got at least two. He says, no, we got 240. We got 22 people. I said, we got 240. I said, he said, 20 people now. And I said, okay, good. Boom, boom. I fired them up. I called Fisherman's Landing. Fisherman's Landing, Nova, 240 being at 220. <laughs> so the next thing I heard was, what the shit? All the other boats on the radar come on. What the hell? So God rest his soul. Pool call me. Bill Pool call me on the radio. He goes, why didn't you put that out? Because everybody's 20 miles outside of us. You know, yeah. I said, I did. I did put it out. Did you put it out? Nobody came back to me. Yeah. And finally, Dick Gaydash came on the radio and he says, Bill, he says, he put it out. I heard him. But that was that was fun. Freaking amazing. How that about best Coronado Island bite? Yellowtail fishing at the islands. Which uh, you're not, not going to believe this one. I'm gonna. I freaking can't wait to hear it, man. Uh, you're not going to believe this one. 74, 75, 74, 74, yeah. Fish and fool. My boat. I had a, we called them the blue lids. I had a Roy, Rotary Club charter from Arizona. And they poured their self off the bite off the bus the night before, about seven o'clock at night. You talk about they were all boozed up. Oh my god! <laughs> Drinking from frickin' Arizona to yeah. Fisherman's Landing. Yeah, yeah. So I said, okay, we're not going albacore fishing. Straight rent rods. And of course they were happy. I always gave people the option, you know, because go to the island, catch some fish. You don't get seasick. They're already sick. You yeah, know, they're friggin'. So I said, at least I could sleep all night, you know, and I got a chance. Yeah. So I anchored up at uh, huh, what we call Jackass Rock, Rock. It's in the middle of South Island, uh-huh. way in tight in the kelp on the inside. And, of course, I anchored up first because I left at midnight. And then uh, Malahini anchored up later and the city of Imperial Beach, the half-day boat from Imperial Beach. So the three of us were there. Yeah. And then sometime during the night, the fog rolled in, and it got cold and foggy and winds blowing a little bit, you know. It's kind of a gnarly morning. But we were picking panita, short barracuda, calicos, and we'd hook two or three yellowtail. And everybody was happy, and my crew's down there. I got th- I had three crew members that day with me, and they were hooking and handing for the guys, and everybody's tickled to death. And I slept in until about 9.30. Jeez. Yeah, because nice. every- everything was cool. Yeah. And uh, I heard the other two boats pull their anchors, start the motors, and leave. So now we're sitting there all by ourselves. And I got up and then had my breakfast, and I'm walking back there, and I'm just watching things. And everybody's just having a ball, you know. And nobody's sick now. Everybody's fine. And uh, one of my crew members hooked a big Bonita, and he's fighting it. You know, he's got it on a jig, and he's fighting it. And I'm standing there watching him, looking over the rail, watching him. His name was Gene Johnson. He's passed away now, but he was a wonderful guy. And I looked down, and the guy next to him, I see this big old sea bass come up and swallow the guy's bait right at the right at the rub rail, you know, because the guy was a rent rotter, didn't yeah. know what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy's going <laughs> like that because the drag was locked up and the whole shebang, you know. <laughs> and it's about to get tangled with Gene's bonita, so I reached <laughs> over, grabbed Gene's line, and ripped wrapped around and popped him off real fast. Yeah. Well, as God is my witness, the fish came under the boat like cordwood, sea bass. And the next thing I know, yellowtail. And next thing I know, bluefin tuna. Wow! I got all you three. Freaking kidding me! I got all three fish in the corner and two feet under the boat, going nuts. Yeah. 
You mean you had sea bass, yellows, and BFT mixed? Yes, ma'am. You yes, throw sir. a bait and you don't know what you're going to hook. You but it's going to be something really freaking good. You didn't have to throw nothing. I, we tied on every jig we had in our boxes. We t- under the rent rods now. And I went into galley and got my albacore feathers with the big double hooks. Oh, and shit. And tied them on the rent rods. And all you had to do was take it out of gear and drop it, and you were on. With the hooks? Yes. Just the fucking bear uh, hooks? Yeah. Oh. Well, the feathers or the jigs. Oh, shit. That's freaking no awesome. No bait. That's awesome. And so, and the, you know, you can't imagine. They're going, yeah, pow, pow. They're just busting them off like crazy. <laughs> So, and then they turn around and go, oh, man. You know, they, they, they couldn't tie another hook on. They couldn't do anything. So I finally got to the point where I just told my crew, I'll chum, you guys just have at it. <laughs> and we had a, like, 25 yellowtail, over 35 sea bass, and over 35 bluefin. Wow. With a rent rod charter. Jeez, a bunch of friggin' drunks, too. And the sea lion shut it off. Oh, wow. Sea lion shut it off. What I'm an all amazing. sitting there all by myself. <laughs> just, just it was amazing day. And then I went around and fished other spots, and I went back two or three hours later and got a rebite, but it only lasted about ten minutes because the sea lions moved in again. Jeez, what a memory, huh? That nah, was too much. I, out of nowhere. That's what I'm saying. You never know what's gonna happen. Deep sea fishing, baby. It's it's the best, right? It's all up here. What you can imagine could happen. Let's get up here to this neck of the woods and a day that I think you were out near Furman or something like that on the Big Daddy. You told me about a sea bass bite that you had on that boat where I think you were out there alone, weren't you, by yourself? Yeah. Wait, 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 tell us that one. Well, I was always, I'm always doing that. I got, I... Not anymore because Philip and Steve and I are, we're, we're right here, man. Just yeah. shoot us a text. I know. Be, well, I do. Are we here. going this afternoon after this, by the way? <laughs> I don't know if they got my starter fixed. God or not. darn it, Rafa, get that starter fixed. But I was never one to sit at the dock. I, you know, I owned the Ports of Call Sports Fishing at the time and half a dozen boats, but I still had my little skipjack that I would go fishing on. And um, I, I wandered into a sea bass bite at Point Firm, and it was pretty funny because. Uh, one of the other boats came in and he had some squid left over and he was going to dump it. I said, don't dump. It was Norm Kakaka. That's who it was on the show gun. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was going to dump it. He'd been saving it all week long. And I said, I told him, don't dump that squid. Give it to me. I'll go catch some sea bass at Furman. You mean he's uh, going to just dump it in the harbor? Yeah. He goes, ah, you ain't going to catch squat. Just give me, the, give me the bait, okay? So, of course, I went out and instant, just knocking the sea bass. And I fished them for like two weeks straight. Every day, every day, boom, boom, boom. And one day, uh, I took Pat Conklin, Steve Cadota, Marf Dorfin, myself, and another captain from 22nd Street. His name was Steve. And he ran the Pacific Outdoor, and I can't remember his last name. But we all went out, five of us on that little skipjack. And we anchored up, and it was Katie bar the door. You watch him eat your bait two feet under the boat. Shh. Yeah. At Furman? At Furman. And what grade of fish? Uh, they were mostly 12 to 20. Nice. Nice yeah. fish. Yeah. Yeah. So the word gets out. And, of course, this is wintertime now, like in November or December. And so some of the boats go out there to goof off to, and it just so happens it was just one spot that was producing and you had to be on that spot, and your chum had to go a certain way. The fish were moving outside of the high spot onto this little ridge and working their way out to the end of it into the mud. Yeah. In fact, I took, uh, I can't think of his name now. Used to write for Western Outdoor News. I took him out one time. Rich Holland? No. no. I know Rich Holland very well. Me too. I can tell it you a funny at, story about it him was at later. The same, yeah, it was at the same time. I tried to contact him a while back. It didn't work. How come? He's on Facebook. I, I talk to him every once in a while. Oh, well, I thought he was on that magazine, uh, the, the new magazine that started running. Maybe he is. I don't know. Anyway, uh, took the writer out, and we caught him with him. And he wrote a story. And then he retired. He did. He retired and went to uh, Costa Rica or somewhere south. But it was an everyday thing for quite that whole winter, I think, off and on. Every time I could get out there, 
A lot of fun. Amazing. Furman's still one of my favorite spots. We went there with you, Philip, and uh, you and I went there a month ago. And it was friggin' nonstop action. Bonita, Barracuda, nice bass. Good fishing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's become very popular in the last few years, and it's an easy one to find because it sticks out of the water half the time. Yeah. And yeah. it boils, and, you know, if you've got a skiff, it's 30 minutes from, or a uh, 30 seconds from the breakwater. Amazing. Tom, let's uh, let's bring this up to right now because the DFG has announced that in some areas you'll be able to fish up to 100 fathoms for a rock cod now. Um, first of all, what areas can you not fish 100 fathoms in? Well, I'm not perfectly clear on that yet. Okay, but uh, you can't fish in any of those cow cod <clears throat> conservation areas, right? No. Well, you can, but only to... 40 fathoms. Right. Correct. Correct. But you can't fish that 100 fathoms. So no. No. What, is that a game changer? Is that going to improve things for people? I'm not sure. Because they, they still have only a two hook. And if the wind's blowing or the current's running, you're going to have to drop five to seven pounds to get down that deep. And I don't know how, unless you got electric reels, I don't know how many people are going to crank 20 minutes. Make you healthy, hour. man. No, it hurts. <laughs> it hurts when you're our age. We got these young mooses out here that can do it, right? I just like when we we didn't fish that deep. Well, with I you. don't know. I think I heard one of the young mooses. Oh, the that's other, true. The other day it was crying like your a baby. cousin Cole, freaking strapping, right? Look, yeah, muscle strapping, builder. muscular guy. You know, like I wouldn't f with him. I want him to be our bodyguard. Oh my forearm! Oh, it hurts so much. Remember, it's right? Forearm. Yeah, his forearm and his back. Yeah. So you're right. So, but you can, on a good day, you can fish two pounds and get away with it and be fine, right? Until the current starts going or the wind starts right. blowing, yeah. Right. Is, so is it, is it a game, to, or is it, is it a welcome, are you, are you happy to hear that? If I, was, if I was running a three-quarter day boat local here now, I would love to do it. Yeah. I would love to do it. And I would make it perfectly clear to everybody about a ticket on the boat. We're fishing deep and we're staying deep. So bring the appropriate tackle. The pro well, yes and no. I mean, I don't want to give things away, but my understanding is from Michael told me yesterday that a five-pound sinker is going to cost you 50 bucks. What the F? Yeah. Jesus. we got to go into the sinker business, boys. Come on. Lead. Yeah. See, back in the 50s, 60s, 40s, and the rest of it, we, we went around and bought sass weights up where they are tearing old houses right. down yeah that's what we yeah when you fish commercially for sure you had sash even, weights all yeah, the time even on my sand dab fishing the last two years i i buy rebar and cut it up in two pound weights oh, that's a good idea yeah even then they cost about three bucks a piece yeah yeah and fishing here we have the specter right here you're not a big fan when you're surface fishing but for fishing bottom stuff cod it's good right yeah it's really good because you can get so much line on a reel now I mean, the biggest thing back in the day was the four aughts and the six aughts. Even the six aughts, you know, you when you get that spool down to this much, and then it takes forever to crank it up. God Almighty, I know. And these reels, they got these two speed reels now. The ones we used the other day, or I used when I went out by myself, I'd be six hundred feet down. I still got a spool that thick. Yeah, it's amazing. So mm -hmm. it's easier to crank them in. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So it is a good thing. Uh, you're looking forward to it, maybe. You just got to be careful when you you got more people on the boat. You don't get the mono tangled with the spectra because it's a bitch. It's a headache, isn't it? I just cut it. I can't deal with it. What's the trick? Look, look. The minute you, when get, two, the yeah, minute, the minute you the minute you give it slack, you're done. You're not going to untangle it. So if you're tangled with the guy next to you, the worst thing you can do is stop reeling. Both of you reel together. As soon as you suddenly lose your weight, you got to start cranking till you got even weight. Right. And then when you realize who you're tangled with, you got to keep your tips spread apart and let the crew member get between you. I'll get in there with eight people, my head right in a massive gang of hooks and sinkers and bullshit <laughs> but that's the way you can spin them out and untangle them yeah when they come together like that and somebody gives it slack it's over bring it on the boat and cut it out yeah yeah the minute you don't feel weight there's something you either got fish that I mean, are yeah. lifting your sinker off the bottom duh what happened yeah or you're effed up with somebody right exactly yeah so that's 
the key. That's what everybody's got to keep in their brain when they're rock out fishing. You know what the worst thing is? What? Especially sand dab fishing. When you have novices, they get stopped by the mackerel on the way down. They don't realize it. And oh, my God, you talk about a mess. They're just standing there like this, and their mackerel's down there loading up a 20-hook gany and going wacko, grabbing the whole boat. Oh, God. All right. Well, so that, that, that I want to talk to you. You mentioned two-speed reels a second ago and, and how technology has changed the game. How many big fish have you been on for multiple hours in the old days with that old tackle? And what happened? Have you been on big fish like that before? Yeah. Dozens and dozens of times. I'll go to the worst one ever. Trolling for yellowfin tuna. Where? Uh, I was off of like Carlsbad. Mm-hmm. When? Just want to get this. 1968. Okay. 69. And the tuna were up late that season, so I left from Newport. And I actually got to where I could see the San Diego fleet, and nothing was going on. And we had one stop on the tuna all by ourselves, and the sea lions put it down. And we actually started home. And the, my boss at the time that owned the boat, he wasn't on the boat that day. This was a goof-off trip with my friends. Five captains and two deckhands. Ricky Dozberg again. So this is a funny story. So anyway, I had a rod and reel on the boat that was a 10 knot, 10 knot reel. Yeah. Black 10 knot. Mm-hmm. And I had these pes- what we call pescador feathers. They're plastic heads about this long with feathers going. So they're about this long total between them. Yeah. Well, I had them in tandem of three with a seven-aught sidewash hook on the back. And the yellowfin were eating that? And the you... real... Marlin would eat my that My boss too, right? was an ex-Detroit Lion football player, and all he wanted to do was catch big yellowfin tuna. We, we caught about 50 of them that year, over 100 pounds. I mean, when everybody's fishing albacore and slaughtering them, I'm down to the beach below San... San uh, almost to San Martin half the time because my boat was fast. Yeah. Just trolling around for big tuna. So we had this rig all rigged up, and it was a 10-aught reel, and it had what we called 120-pound micron. At the time, it was micron line. Uh Uh-huh. Smaller than Dacron. Oh, okay. I think, and the whole spool was full of it. So I had that on there. So we're on our way home, and everybody's got their tackle put together. And I just laid down and put my buddy Doug Harmon on the wheel. He just retired from Dana Point a few years ago. And he goes, hey, Tom, look at bird school up here. And we're 20 miles on our way home from where we're fishing. Yeah. And I How said, far off the beach I, is this, if you can remember? Well, we're on a straight line from, I'd say, 15 or 20 miles. Okay. So I said, a bird school, huh? What do you see? I see boiling fish. I go, really? I guess we better try that. So I told Ricky, go put the jigs out. So I jumped up, grabbed the wheel. And I didn't even get near that thing, and they're yelling hook up. So I shut her down, I run back there, and that big rod is on, and it's pinned. And Ricky's 200 pounds and strong at the time. He's like 20 years old. Yeah. And he's, he couldn't get it out of the rod holder. Shit. So being stupid on me, I walk back and I, get out of the way, son. Let a man in here. <laughs> Uh-oh. That was the biggest mistake I ever made in my I, I, life. Yeah, it sounds like it. So six and a half hours later, I'm sitting on the deck with the rod on the rail and my knees up on the bulwarks with a hammer laying next to me. I would hammer that the, drag. Jesus. And the fish would pull the line out no matter what I did and wouldn't break. And I'm going, what mm. the f- is this? Yeah. Well, in the meantime, they put 77 fish on the boat, 20 to 35 pounds. While you're on this big fish. While I'm on this fish. And God I keep almighty. begging for somebody to spell me. And they're just laughing at me. Oh, you like, wanted it, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm dying because this fish would just take line. Just, and you, all you could do is put both hands, just hold on. The rod's pinned against the rail, but just to hold the butt. It wanted to launch me over the rail. God almighty. Yeah, I'm serious. And Jesus. I'm, I'm a big boy. Yeah. And I'm going, man, I got... Charlie Tuna here, buddy. That's all there is to it. <laughs> and Ricky's always saying, he's got Charlie, he's got Charlie. <laughs> Six and a half hours later, boom. Oh, oh, heartbreak. Never got a look at it? Uh-uh. 
that sucker would go down and there was no way you were going to stop it. And of course, there was so much line on the reel, he'd finally stop and then he'd swim up. And you would, he's wind, got a wind, wind, 2,000 wind. yards of line he's taken out already or 1,000 or whatever it is. And you got to wind, wind, wind to catch, catch up, up with him, him until your arm's going to fall off. Jesus. And then as soon as you catch up, and then it's mm, 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 oh, back you, down again. I mean, for six like, and a half hours. Oh, oh, my God. So I reeled that sucker up, and he broke that seven-up sidewash hook. Oh, the hook broke. Broke it. broke it. Jesus. And I said, I definitely had Charlie Tuna. You have a guess at how big that fish was? No way to guess. Had to be over two. Oh, I'm, yeah, well, yeah, it's over two. But the problem is, back in those days, we hooked a lot of those fish. We never caught them. They blow up the reels, break your hooks, pop the line, because there was no way to stop them. They were in deep water. Yeah. They don't catch those big fish down the beach in deep water. They catch them in shallow water. Right, the right. fish get disoriented, and they just come up and die. Right. But you hook one of them yellowfin tuna, of them 300-pounders and 400-pounders in deep water, you ain't going to catch them. My God. Not going to catch them. I don't even think you can catch them with the new reels they got now. That's I had amazing. A, I had a stop on the Big Daddy, my little... My little boat down there on big, big elephant tuna. We all three reels blew up, three of us. Boom! Just exploded. Freaking crazy, man. Four odds. Jeez, that is freaking amazing. Well, I want to transition now to something that a lot of people don't know. You're really good at marlin fishing. And how do you like fishing marlin? Do you like that? Here's my, I love fishing marlin. Here's my story. Yeah, and people don't believe me when I tell them. If the only thing that's biting is is sculpin or rockfish or calico bass, I'm just as eager to fish a calico bass or a sculpin as I am a marlin. Yeah. It's fishing. Right. I, I'm with you on that, man. I love marlin fishing, but I love it when they're biting and they're showing. I don't like the boring trolling around. Now, if you get jig bit every 15 or 20 minutes, that's okay. Yeah. But I love eyeball fish and baiting them. Yeah. Because it goes back to your hunting, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, you got to pay attention. For, with eyeball fish, man, you got to freaking work. You can't put your fucking feet up on the dash and hope you get a jig strike. Well, that's the way 90% of these guys fish. And you can't do that, man. You got to work at it. Well, if you see any of the guys that are winning the tournaments, they're, they're team, team effort. They work their butts off. They got, what, $5,000 gyro binoculars now? Right. I could never afford it. My eyes were never that good anyway, but... You, you're not just seeing a little tip of a fin in the water that sticks up that high that might glisten in the sun. Or it might be one bird that's, that's going like this, just looking down. Uh -huh. You can't just look at the water. You can't just look at the horizon. you got to look at everything. Right. Plus your meters, your sonars. you got to look at all that stuff, too. Best marlin bite you ever have been in. One of the best bites. Tell me about it. No, well, that was it. Well, it was a place we call uh, uh, Red Hill, just just above uh, the Gordo Banks in in Baja. Okay, down near Cabo, right? Cabo, yeah. Yeah. I'm familiar. Uh, with I that only area. had ten rods and reel in the boat with six people, and I'd keep ten fish hooked up all the time. What? Yeah, just pin a caballero, would drop it over the swim step, and watch them eat it, fight over it. Are you shitting me? No. You'd freaking drop it right and watch. Yeah, Two or three has, marlin come out. That's, that's not even that rare. I know, but it's still bitching, man. And when the guys go down to uh, San, um, San Catine and Mag Bay and out there in the 10 and all those oh, spots. I know. They, they get it. They get it all the time. Yeah. Sean Morgan's down there. He's a buddy of yours, right? Yeah, he started He's tournament. quite an accomplished. He started tournament fishing, tournament fishing with us back in the 80s. Oh, did he? Yeah, I, I actually participated. I won the Gold Cup twice in 10 years. And if you stop and think about it, I think the Gold Cup was won eight out of the ten times by three boats. Wow. Yeah. So I think guys, something like that, yeah. Yeah. Sean, what's your opinion of him as a fisherman? Remember, he's going to be listening to this, so don't get his – his head's already big enough as it is. Sean's a lot like me. He started from the bottom of sport fishing and worked his way up and learned it all, all the way and got good at all of it. Yeah. He's freaking a very capable fisherman. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, you mentioned to me, you're looking at him down there in Cabo right now saying, God damn, I might want to go down there. Well, it makes me want to go back down there, even though the last time I was there, there was still one telephone and no paved road. Oh, shit. It's been that long? 
75. Wow. Yeah, I was down there then, too. I was eating freaking chicken tacos. And who the fuck was that? Um, I can't. Now, I'm, I can't remember. It was some guy in sport fishing. And he was sitting right behind me. And it was just, a, he'll remember. He'll watch this and call me and tell yeah. me, you dickhead. You forgot. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I remember those days. When there was one hotel, I think it was the Finisterra, the Solmar, one of those. It was great. Those days were great. Well, but, they were just building the Solomar when I was there. Okay. And the Finisterra had just opened. Uh, the best Kenny Hess was the guy sitting behind yeah, me. Yeah, Pooh Bear. Yeah, yeah, I was down there with him. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, yeah, that's a funny story. I was tied up to the to the fuel dock where the cannery is. Yeah. On the pier. And we were backed in there, tied up and taken on fuel. And all of a sudden, there was, and I was, I wasn't paying attention. I look up. And here's this, what's the name of that boat? God damn it. God, talk about the geriatric can't remember shit scene. Oh, man. Well, on a, you know, that fast, to bring it up that fast. And I look up and here's Frank Hall, Roger Hess, Kenny Hess, and the True Love Boys yelling at me. And they just came out of nowhere. And the only person that was down there, there was only two guys down, three guys down there at the time that I knew. So it was nice to see somebody else. Yeah, definitely. Kenny Dickerson was down there and Pat Trainer. I don't know if you ever knew Pat Trainer, but he started Trainer Martin Lures and Albacore Lures. Oh, right, right, right. And then Zucker picked it up from him. Yeah. And, of course, Zucker was a pinhead for me back in the 60s. Really? Yeah. Wow. John, yeah, John Lloyd. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was a pinhead. You've survived two ha- heart attacks at sea. Two, yeah. Yeah, and Philip, he pulled this spider thing on you the other day. He said he wouldn't have done it if he knew you had so many heart attacks. I told him, go ahead and do it anyway. Yeah, well, but I don't, what, what, I don't what, scare easy. <laughs> what were the circumstances of the heart attacks? I mean, were they dicey or were you, did you realize you were having a heart attack? Did you think it was indigestion or something or what? Yeah, I thought it was indigestion, but didn't mm-hmm. want to start hurting up in my chin and my jaw. Um, my friend gave me a book and showed me these pictures and diagrams and explanations of what that was. And I said, holy mackerel. I'm having a heart attack. Yeah, well, it's precursor to the big one, you know. And hey, guys, we're going to call it a little early today. Keep catching them sea bass. Well, I'm we having were, a heart attack. Two days. I was on the boat for four hours, the bad one was. And then two days later, I still hadn't done anything. And I read the book, and I jumped in my truck and drove 50 miles down to my best friend's hospital. And uh, the next day, they were opening me up. Jesus. So. Have you ever uh, had a guy go overboard? Man overboard? Three or four times. What's one of the more memorable times a guy's gone overboard? Did he fall over, jump? And some guys jump over. When Back on the fishing fool again. Oh, my God, that fishing fool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it got five of the best, six of the best years of my life. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we're fishing down the beach, kind of off of, in tight. In tight on the beach down uh, around uh, Santo Tomas. And it tends to blow there a lot. And it was blowing all night long. So you could see the combers going down or going downhill, right? Down swell. So at night when you're driving, you could see the white caps going by the boat. But it's still a good ride. So <laughs> same thing, put the lines out, daylight, start trolling, got a hook up, pulled them back not realizing it was pretty choppy. And all of a sudden I heard, we went sideways and hooked a couple of bait fish, and then I hear this, hey, it went over. I go, huh? I look back and <laughs> this guy, he backed up to the bait tank, and then he ran towards the stern rail, and the fishing fool was also a dive boat. Yeah. So it had a gate in the middle of the stern rail. Yeah. And he hit that gate, pow, and he went right in what the water. What did he do that for? What was he doing? I, don't know. I wanted to outcast everybody else, I guess. Oh, he was just making a cast. Yeah, making yeah. a cast. Okay. That happens not that in well, three times. It doesn't happen all the time, but it happens, yeah, it's right? it's happened three times to me. So a guy's making a cast, the Right boat's... when the boat rolls. Yeah. Right, and then you're in the freaking dark. Yeah, well, it depends on how high the rail is, but some of the rails, you know, if you're, yeah. if you're grandfathered in, your rail's lower than now. Yeah. So it hits you right about here. Yeah, and you're screwed, and your man. your body weight's bigger up here. Yep. You're going. Yeah. So anyway, it's blowing, right? And I see this guy's, I can't swim, I can't swim. Jesus. He's all bundled up. Luckily, he had a Boy Scout jacket on. And it was semi-waterproof water, waterproof jacket. Yeah. 
So is he getting I away? Just, is he getting away from you pretty fast? Well, yeah, the boat's drifting like crazy. Yeah. So he's going past the stern and headed up towards the side. And I just looked around real quick, and the longest thing I could see was somebody brought a goddamn what do you call it? surf rod? Yeah, big old long surf rod with a big spinning reel on it, right? So I just grabbed that sucker and I leaned over the side and put my foot on the guardrail, one hand here and the rod out here, and I he just got a hold of the tip. Jesus. And I just slowly, slowly pulled him in. And the tip didn't come off. But he finally got up to where he could reach the whole rod. And then I pulled him right in. And the guys told me later, said, hey, you just, you pull that guy up to the guardrail by yourself. I go, huh? He goes, yeah, you put him, you put one arm underneath this, under his arm and pulled him right up to where we, we could get him. And that's about three feet out of the water. I said, I didn't even realize it. So... Get him on the boat, right? And within an hour, it was too shitty to even fish. So I just started trolling slowly for home. I swear to God, I gave him all my spare clothes I had on the boat because he was my size. So you were I worried about him. hypothermia or what? Yeah. Yeah. Or just being cold. Yeah. And everybody else is in the galley because we're taking them over at the top, trolling slowly going for home. <laughs> all the way over the top, all the way off the stern. And my deckhand says, hey, look at that guy. So I look back, there he is, standing there holding a trolling rod, getting drowned. <laughs> Hardy guy, man. You got to admire him. The spirit, yeah. Yeah, I, I go, love it. Oh, there goes my spare clothes. Oh, man. He's all wet now, nothing I can do to help him. You found a headless corpse. I did. Well, tell me about that. It wasn't pleasant. No, I'm and sure luckily it wasn't. for me, luckily for me, I was on the fishing fool. <laughs> Oh, my God. Yeah. Jeez. I only had the boat five years now, remember. Oh, my God. That fishing fool. And this was off of Huntington Beach coming to the boatyard <clears throat> to haul out. It was just me and my second operator, Fred Patty. And uh, I said, I hate, to th- I hate to say this, but I don't like what I see over here in the water. Let's go take a look. So you had a, a, cor- a corpse floating. You could tell it was I, a human. Well, I, no, could. I couldn't tell, but I'm pr- pretty sure it was. Yeah. But it was bloated up really bad. Mm-hmm. And I've seen enough bloated whales, and I've seen enough bloated other uh, dolphins and stuff to know this wasn't either one of those. So I slowly pulled up from it downwind, and whew, I can't do that. So I went around and went upwind and came down and put Fred up. He went up to the bow. And, yeah, that's a dead one. Oh, that's terrible. Guy had Levi's on and no head, and uh, his extremities, fingers, and everything was all gone, been eaten by animals. Something. So I called the Harbor Department and lifeguards, and they came out. I had to wait there for them to get on him. And they couldn't even use the strainer. They had to use a blanket. Oh, God. So, yeah, that wasn't pleasant. Tom, this has been everything and more than I thought it was going to be. And we haven't even scratched the surface, man. You are going to have to come back. You are a fascinating guy. You've had so many great stories from the past. And we're definitely going to have to have you back again. And I sincerely hope all these nice things I'm saying about you right now will induce you to take me fishing now in about 10 minutes. I'm only kidding. It has been a freaking pleasure. You are an extraordinarily interesting guest, and I've enjoyed it, man. Yeah, me too. I'm, uh, I just love the industry, the sport fishing that much that you can see when I went out with you. I didn't even fish that much. Yeah, I know. You're just... I get more kick out of watching you guys. Right, right. And then busting your balls, you know. <laughs> so that's it. You're good at that. Did you want to say something to Tom before we end this uh, edition? You said you did at one point. Philip? Sure. Or, yeah, I know you wanted to I'll just... I'll jump on real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Tom, you know, it's... it's I love this industry so much, and it's cool to hear that history of where all this started. Like, I know we're all kind of cut from the same cloth being anglers and it's it's cool to have guys like you still in this industry that built it up from where it was and to where it's now it's, it's a lot because of guys like you well you know what i've always looked at it the same way i look at it now if you don't love out there to go fishing if you can just get away from wanting to kill mass murder rape and pillage and just go out and enjoy mother nature in the in the world itself there's nothing better I couldn't tell you how many nights in the dead of the night, three o'clock in the morning, I'm driving the boat and I'm just looking at the ocean, I'm looking at the swells, I'm 
the dolphin come and play in front of the boat in the middle of the night, and they're in the blue water, and they're in the phosphorus, and or you go, you see a big fireworks display in the water when you run over a school of fish. There's nothing better. Yeah, yeah. And well, I just I just want to say thank you for where we're at now. It's such an amazing industry. Thank you for all the hard work you put in coming up because I know it wasn't easy, and I, I know our viewers know from the stories you've been telling. I can honestly tell it was a labor of love my whole life. Yeah. And anybody that can't go out there and enjoy it, they're missing it. Yeah. Tom Durer, everybody, an extraordinary hour with Tom. Thank you all for joining us for another edition of Freedom Adventures. Make sure you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Spotify, and whatever else we're on, Steve. Thanks again, Tom. Great being with you, my friend. Keep it up going.